Good evening, everyone. I'm Robin Garrow, the president of the City University of New York Graduate Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this public conversation. This evening, we are joined by two extraordinary thinkers and artists whose achievements defy easy classification. Maggie Nelson and Wayne Kustenbaum's work spans disciplines and transcends genres. Each of them has been expanding the frontiers of memoir, cultural criticism, and artistic expression. In so doing, Maggie and Wayne have gained recognition from a large, admiring public audience. Theirs is the kind of broad thinking we encourage at the Graduate Center. In pursuing their scholarship, our faculty and students bridge and blend disciplines, and their fresh voices and distinct vantage points help all of us see the world and our places in it in new ways. Now it is my pleasure to introduce and welcome Maggie Nelson, an award-winning poet and essayist and the recipient of a 2016 MacArthur Fellowship, sometimes called the Genius Award. Maggie is a uniquely sensitive observer of art and culture and of her own inner and outward life. The Guardian has called her one of our most radical and forward-looking thinkers. Her 2015 New York Times bestseller, The Argonauts, won a National Book Critics Circle Award. Her most recent book, also a national bestseller, is titled On Freedom, Four Songs of Care and Constraint. It was named a New York Times Notable Book of 2021 and was widely, widely lauded as a best book of last year. Maggie teaches at the University of Southern California. In conversation with Maggie tonight is Wayne Kustenbaum. He is a distinguished professor of English, French, and comparative literature at the Kinney Graduate Center, and also a poet, critic, novelist, artist, filmmaker, and performer. He has published 22 books, including The Queen's Throat. Susan called it a brilliant book, and it was nominated for a National Book Critics Circle Award. In 2020, he received an American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Literature, and his first feature-length film, The Collective, premiered here in New York in 2021. His most recent book, Ultramarine, was published in February of this year. Tonight's event is presented by the Graduate Center's Office of Public Programs and is co-sponsored by the Center for the Humanities and the Leon Levy Center for Biography. It is also something of a reunion. Maggie earned her PhD in English literature here at the Graduate Center, and Wayne was her doctoral dissertation advisor. Maggie and Wayne, welcome. Thank you for inspiring us with your creative endeavors and for joining us this evening. We're looking forward to a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Robin. That's a, a lovely introduction. And it is amazing, Maggie, the time, I mean, futurity and the question of whether there is a future is such a theme in your book, but it is funny to think that, that we began together here so long ago, wherever here is. So welcome back. If, Thank <laughs> wherever Thank we're you. Um, I'm thrilled to be here and, you know, so much that I do, Wayne, revolves around you and so many things were seated at, in time at the Grad Center. So, you know, so it's special to be doing this, even if we're on Zoom and hello to everybody out there, even though we can't see you, we see you, we see that you're there and, um, and hi. So, yeah. So this and is, where, we're here tonight to, to celebrate and discuss Maggie's book on freedom and it is it is a magnificent book that I dearly love, and I had the pleasure of re-immersing myself in it yesterday and today. And do you see all these little tabs? These I just saw them. I love it. I can't believe Maggie, it. Maggie, these are for all the places I laughed out loud at your wit. So I want oh, to fantastic. I want us to think together about your gift for uh, for comedy and and, <laughs> and 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 for provoking a, a kind of uh, sublime transcendent laughter. Um, we agreed, and I think it would be a lovely idea if you began, if you still are in the mood for that, by reading a passage from the book. Yes, and um, you know, one of my one of my deep you know fears in life is just like not being funny, like while being surrounded by charismatic, funny people. So I, so your post-its are are 
page markers mean all, mean all the more to me <laughs> if that's what they are. But um, yeah, so I'll read a little bit from this book. I'm just gonna read very little bit. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll read like the first two pages of the introduction and then I'll read the first two pages of the chapter on art. So, um, or three pages of the chapter on art. So for people who don't you know, know this book has this kind of lofty stodgy ish title on freedom and then this the subtitle is um has a little more character four songs of karen constraint and the four songs are um divided up into kind of taking the temperature of liberatory rhetoric in the lands of art uh sexual freedom uh, drugs and addiction uh and climate crisis so um, it's kind of a hard book to read from in that each of the chapters is uh, quite distinct from the others. I've done events where we've only talked about ecology or we've only talked about um, art and we've only talked about um, sex. So this is, um, but I just want to say all that to give you like a greater lay of the land. So, um, so from the introduction, uh, which I read in part because it describes the genesis of the book, but also because it quotes Wayne. So uh, it's the first little section that says, stop here if you want to talk about freedom. I had wanted to write a book about freedom. I'd wanted to write this book at least since the subject emerged as an unexpected subtext in a book of mine about art and cruelty. I'd set out to write about cruelty, then found to my surprise, freedom coming up through the cracks, light and air into cruelty's stuffy cell. Once exhausted by cruelty, I turned to freedom directly. I started with What is Freedom by Hannah Arendt and began to amass my piles. But before long, I diverted and wrote a book about care. Some people thought the book about care was also a book about freedom. This was satisfying as I too felt this to be the case. For some time, I thought a book on freedom might no longer be necessary, maybe not by me, maybe not by anyone. Can you think of a more depleted, imprecise, or weaponized word? I used to care about freedom, but now I mostly care about love, one friend told me. Freedom feels like a corrupt and empty code word for war, a commercial export, something a patriarch might give or rescind, another wrote me. That's a white word, another said. Often I agreed. Why not take up with some less contested, obviously timely and worthy value, such as obligation, mutual aid, coexistence, resiliency, sustainability, or what Manolo Callahan has called insubordinate conviviality? Why not acknowledge that freedom's long star turn might finally be coming to a close, that a continued obsession with it may reflect a death drive? Your freedom is killing me read the signs of protesters in the middle of a pandemic. Your health is not more important than my liberty, masters others shout back. And yet I still could not quit it. Part of the trouble, re, trouble resides in the word itself, whose meaning is not at all self-evident or shared. In fact, it operates more like God in that when we use it, we can never really be sure what exactly we're talking about or whether we are talking about the same thing. Are we talking about negative freedom, positive freedom, anarchist freedom, Marxist freedom, abolitionist freedom, libertarian freedom, white settler freedom, decolonizing freedom, neoliberal freedom, Zapatista freedom, spiritual freedom, and so on. All of which leads to Wittgenstein's famous edict, the meaning of a word is its use. I thought of this the other day when on my university campus, I passed by a table with a banner that read, stop here if you wanna talk about freedom. Boy, do I, I thought. So I stopped and I asked the young white man, probably an undergraduate, what type of freedom he wanted to talk about. He looked me up and down and then said slowly with a hint of menace, a hint of insecurity, you know, regular old freedom. I noticed then that he was selling buttons divided into three categories, saving the unborn, owning the libs and gun rights. As Wittgenstein's work makes clear, that the meaning of a word is its use is no cause for paralysis or lament. It can instead act as an incitement to track which language game is being played. Such is the approach taken in the pages that follow in which freedom acts as a reusable train ticket marked or perforated by the many stations, hands and vessels through which it passes. I am borrowing this metaphor from Wayne Kustenbaum 
who once used it to describe the way a word or a set of words permutates in the work of Gertrude Stein. What the word means is none of your business, Kustenbaum writes, but it is indubitably your business where the word travels. For whatever the confusions wrought from talking about freedom, they do not in essence differ from the misunderstandings we risk when we talk to one another about other things. And talk to one another we must, even or especially if we are, as George Oppen had it, no longer sure of the words. All right, so that's from the introduction and then I'll just read the beginning of the art song. I'll be accompanied lightly by the neighbor's dog. Which you may or may not be able to hear. All right, art song. Uh, this little beginning is called The Aesthetics of Care. A few years ago, I was asked to be on a panel at a museum discussing the aesthetics of care, quote, in quotes. The invitation read, quote, in a year 2016 marked by divisive political rhetoric and acts of exclusion, the question of care has newly and forcefully emerged within cultural discourse. What might, this is still all the invitation, what might an aesthetics of care look like today as a deep structure to drive artistic practice formally and materially? How do ideas of care as a form too of love transform the aesthetics of protest? How does art survive? How can we care for it? And how can it care for us? End quote. This event never got off the ground, but the invitation alone got me thinking. And I might add that this was like, the beginning of invitations about care of which now I think I may, may have received like two dozen since then. Um, in a world in which so many do not have enough care, indeed are aggressively, often punishingly uncared for, or are regularly coerced into caring for others at the expense of themselves or their loved ones. Not to mention a world in which the regular triumph of something we sometimes call freedom over and opposed to something we sometimes call care may very well end up responsible, not just for much past and current suffering, but also for extinguishing planetary life as we know it. The urge to seek and valorize care in everything, including in art, makes sense. The urge correlates to the demand coalescing in activist circles for some time for a politics of care, defined by some activists as, quote, a new kind of politics organized around a commitment to universal provision for human needs, countervailing power for workers, people of color, and the vulnerable, and a rejection of carceral approaches to social problems, end quote. This urge also finds inspiration and echo in the work of scholar Christina Sharp, who among others has imagined care as, quote, a way to feel and to feel for and with, a way to tend to the living and the dying, end quote, and linked it specifically to art making and art viewing. Given my interest in all of the above, why I wondered was my first response to an aesthetics of care as something that would extend beyond an animating principle for certain artists, yuck. In pondering, I realized that while I've always taken issue with art that aims to endanger or terrorize its audience or participants, I've never gone to art looking for care, at least not in any direct fashion. In fact, I've often felt that art's not caring for me is precisely what gives me the space to care about it. Certainly I have been moved and nourished by some art that is motivated by care, just as I have at times felt myself motivated by it, though I usually suspect the motivation. But I have long valued arts not caring as a portal to forms of freedom and sustenance that differ in key ways from those engendered by politics, therapeutics, or direct service. As artist Paul Chan has it, quote, collective social power needs the language of politics which means among other things that people need to consolidate identities, provide answers, make things happen. Whereas my art, Chan still talking, is nothing if not the dispersion of power. And so in a way, the political project and the art project are sometimes in opposition, end quote. Acknowledging and allowing for this opposition when it occurs is not the same as cordoning aesthetics off from politics. It is about attending to and allowing for differences between sensibilities, spheres, and types of experience, and letting go of the insistence that aesthetic and political practice mirror each other or even correspond amicably. This is especially crucial when it comes to the call for care, which is a much trickier rallying cry when it comes to art than it may initially appear. 
This trickiness has to do with art status as a third thing between people whose meaning as Jacques Rancière has it is owned by no one, but which subsists between artist and spectator, excluding any uniform uh, transmission, any identity of cause and effect. Whereas care can slip quickly into paternalism or control when it is not experienced as care by its receiver. Just think of the last time someone did something you didn't want or like because they quote unquote cared about you. Art is characterized by the indeterminacy and plurality of the encounters it generates, be they between a work and its maker, a work and its variegated audience, or a work of art in time. Its capacity to mean differently to different viewers, some of whom have not yet been born or who died long ago, will always complicate any judgment that pretends certainty about any given work's meaning or that purports that meaning to be self-evident or fixed. This indeterminacy has never kept critics or curators or panel organizers from participating in the age old sport of imbuing a philosophical, political or ethical concept with a positive valence or a negative one as with Hitler's degenerate art and then gathering art under its rubric. Progressive and conservative critics alike for lack of better terms play this game insofar as both often embrace the premise that art has a moral function such as showing us how to live or encouraging connection, or underscoring another value, be it care, community, beauty, honor, subversion, sociality, wildness, etc. In literary circles, philosopher Martha Nussbaum has become well known for the reading novels makes us better people argument. They have to be the right novels, of course, Master of Relations, Henry James, Thumbs Up, Solipsistic, Beckett, Thumbs Down. Many critics have run poetry through a similar sieve as when Juliana Spar argues that, quote, when we tackle literary criticism's central question of what sort of selves literary works create, we should value works that encourage connection, end quote. But how can one sort out which works encourage connection and which don't, when the one thing all art does, even Beckett's, is transmit a signal, put forth a communication, which is by no means ontologically invalidated as a transmission if it expresses misanthropic, opaque, or antisocial elements. Such underlying moralism may be one reason why abstract theorizing about art can take a bit of an embarrassing turn when it runs into actual works of art or artists who often prefer that the field of play remain less sanitized. Here, for example, is Amy Silman, painter Amy Silman, recounting a talk she attended by Franco Berardi. Silman writes, I recently heard Bifo Berardi give a talk about not working, something that does not make a lot of sense if you actually like working in your studio. Finally, Bifo made a distinction between work and art, saying that to make art is to make something beautiful, meaningful, erotic, empathetic. And as usual, when this is the language used to describe what we're doing, I wanted to barf. We're not making sexy beasts. If anything, call it libido instead of erotics but we want an art also animated by ugliness, destruction, hatred, struggle. Punk seems as close as one could get to describe it, but what could be less punk than staying up late in a studio, trying hard to make a better oil painting? It's so earnest, it's so caring with our smock, our tongue between our teeth, our paintbrush poised, trying so hard like artists in a Jerry Lewis movie. What are we doing? I can still only call it looking for this fragile thing that is awkwardness. This is not alienated labor, nor a commodity precisely, but a need, a way of churning the world as your digestive system churns food. So that was Selman's long quote. Selman's wanting to barf echoes my yuck. Both are visceral, admittedly juvenile efforts to repel the critic's dogged desire to convert a corporal, compulsive, potentially pathetic, ethically striated or agnostic activity into something beautiful, meaningful, erotic, and empathetic. Both cleave to art making as a metabolic activity, a way of churning the world, rather than something in need of defending, alchemizing, or otherwise proven socially worthy. Note too that Selman's version of caring for art conjures the simple image of the artist in her studio trying to make a better oil painting. Caring for art, so far as most artists are concerned, often means finding the time, space, proficiency, and determination to make the best thing possible, whatever that means to her. For those who remain disproportionately engaged in providing care for others, which still typically means women, 
This caring may also entail figuring out how to suspend or offload the burden of caring for others long enough to be able to stand around your studio with your smock on and your paintbrush poised. When I write about art, I try to keep this wanting to barf in mind. I try to imagine approaches that don't moralize or nauseate, knowing that we all have our hobby horses. Openness, nuance, context, indeterminacy might be mine. I try to keep in mind the artist's body, what it feels, what it wants, what it's compelled to try, along with the knowledge that failure, aesthetic and otherwise, is an integral, integral inevitable part of the process. I try to keep alive Sontag's simple question. What would criticism look like that would serve the work of art and not usurp its place? For this is not just a matter of how to write good criticism or how to keep criticism in its allegedly proper place, i.e. subservient to the genius art that gives it rise. It's also an ethical matter insofar as Sontag's question reminds us that the world does not exist to amplify or exemplify our pre-existing tastes, values, or predilections. It simply exists. We don't have to like all of it or remain mute in the face of our discontent. But there's a difference between going to art with the hope that it will reify a belief or value we hold and feeling angry and punitive when it does not and going to art to see what it's doing, what's going on treating it as a place to get, as Eileen Miles once put it, the real and irregular news of how others around us think and feel. All right, so thank you for listening. That was longer than I thought, but uh, I wanted to get to the wanting to barf because Wayne had mentioned it yesterday. So there you have it. And I'm glad that you made it to Eileen Miles too. It's a, <laughs> they're both gorgeous, gorgeous passages and there's so many words in them that I had already underlined and wanted to ask you about. And I'm, a, I'm I, I could, we could just close to read this together giggling and that would be something, but there are larger issues that we will also cover. But let me start with process because I so loved the way you ended that first paragraph where you said, I started with what is freedom by Hannah Arendt and began to amass my piles. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a really dramatic, almost like Samuel Beckett a bit. I, right. Passing and the, 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 so I got, it made me, procedurally really wonder because one thing that is so marvelous about all of your nonfiction writing is the sense of the piles and the having and, and the, the how, how much reading and thinking you've done and how quixotically you've organized it into different piles so that the bits move together and can converse with each other. So I'm, I really am curious I don't want to be one of those people that say, do you use like a ballpoint pen or do you type? <laughs> but tell me about the piles. Well, you're probably also picking up on, you know, and there's something there's something kind of scatological to the piles as well. I can't even remember what piles are. I think that they're like some form of anyway, but it doesn't matter. But the point is, is that I do think of it as kind of like the reason why I say that is only because um, you know, of that Silman quote and like the kind of like, you know, the kind of um. I mean, what you just said about like ordering things, like I do feel like there's a lot of tension between this kind of, you know, this like stew or muck or shit or whatever, which is like research. And then, and then what you're describing is like the quixotic effort to organize is like, yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's like you're, you're only armed with your curiosity and your capacity to organize or like your capacity and that's kind of or like to juxtapose really, you know, or to connect. And so I feel like I do read, especially for this book, I, I, uh, I didn't know, like, I mean, I think we, you and I probably talked about, I mean, I can remember when I told you about the book on cruelty and I was just like, oh, I'm writing this book on cruelty and this, this project had a similar like keyword approach, like, oh, I'm writing about freedom. And, and in both cases, like the book on cruelty, like I didn't, I didn't narrow it down that that would be only about art for a very long time. Like it, it could have been, I mean, I, I was inspired by your book, Humiliation. I think we even talked about that series, but it could have been like much broader. Um, but it, but I eventually decided like after a lot of research and writing that like that would be just art. This book was like really different where I, I had to read like I read like a lot of political theory and a lot of writing about like slavery and uh, you know huge books about freedom and unfreedom and they're not like both kind of in in, in history 
um, in politics and then also in kind of psychoanalytical senses. Um, and then all of that, all of that, I mean, I'm sure it imbues the project, but all of that research kind of just is not that visible. It's, 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 it's scantily mentioned in the introduction, but, but really I ended up, you know, as I, as I moved through all this reading with just this keyword approach and like my, you know, trusty pencil, it would just mark everything that I read. And then I kind of compile all the passages of the reading and the thoughts that I had about them into like a long file. And then as that file got like longer and longer and longer, those are like the amassed piles, um, you know, I'd print it all out and I'd read through it and then kind of like color code which things seemed related to each other. And then it was through like that process that these four topics seemed like they recurred the most, like there were a few other categories too, but um, four seemed like plenty, you know, especially once I started writing one. And I think, I can't remember what I wrote first. Actually, I think I wrote the drug chapter first, but you know, it was running like 80, a hundred pages. And when I realized that that was how long they were all gonna be, I just thought four is, four is enough, you know? It's a really a, a beautiful, you used the word organize, and that reminds me of another moment that I wanted to ask you about later in the book. I think you're quoting, uh, you might be quoting a queer theorist, but you're referring to psychoanalysis or something, mm -hmm. and you, you say something, one of your witticisms, which, and often I think when you're funny, it has to do with coming close to something like scrutinizing like you're, you know, like Elizabeth Bishop in, uh, in the you know whatever the first poem is in North and South, inspecting the yard goods with mm -hmm. two fingers, touching something that somebody says, and then you say, you know, <laughs> no, I don't want that schmada in my. And you do that with the notion of sec the an, one's sexual uh, psychological mechanism. You you say something like, God forbid, I should ever have an organized sexual. Oh right. Psych Something. Right. So I just, I guess that this issue of organization, which you mentioned a couple of times, versus free fall or versus, I don't know, there mm -hmm. isn't a versus, but I, mm -hmm. since you, you were talking about a process of organizing, mm -hmm. I wonder mm -hmm. if you could mm -hmm. say something about the perils of organization or mm -hmm. just what you feel about organization and its brethren or mm -hmm. sisters, the, the near neighbors of organization that are perhaps more compatible with your style. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, obviously the opposite of organization would be like mess. Um, you know, I'm not, like I'm interested in mess and I'm interested in like, you know, paying homage to it and like beholding it, but I'm not, um, but you know, I mean, I think you and I both talked about like, you know, I'm kind of, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a student of the condensory, you know, like I'm not, I'm not someone who, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I think I make recourse to clarity over organization. And I think that the near cousin of uh, organization, which maybe is more amenable to me is like, um, you know, that Artie Lang book, Knots, which it was like so foundational to me when I read it, I'm like drawing it now, but you know, like, you know, he'll draw like a circle and he'll be like, you know, these are like dialogues of patients um, and kind of like the knots um, that their mental illness might have them in. And he'll be kind of like, um, sometimes they're a circle, like that finger is interesting to me. I want to suck it. That finger is disgusting. Take it away. Like kind of like these different things, but like he's mapping them, like he's mapping. They don't have to make any sense. They don't have to be, they can be like an incredibly messy psychic state, but he, through these knots is kind of showing that there's like a you know that there's like a there's there's interrelation and there is like even if it's circular there's like progression or you know within um within the mess of the of the uh to to an outside observer of someone's um um illness and i anyway the knots book uh i i loved and i thought you know this book was called freedom knots for a long time because you know, uh, you know, everyone says like, yeah, we want to be free, but you know, we all know as good students of like psychic ambivalence that like we don't, you know, we, you know, we, we, we pursue a medley of constraint and <laughs> liberation for ourselves. And um, 
I was really interested in uh, in kind of taking a magnifying glass to and trying to like sketch it, which is different than really organizing it, you know? Yeah, no, not, knots is, a, I, I didn't know, I, or I'd forgotten that knots was originally part of the title, but certainly the word knots and processes yeah. of not knotting and unknotting, and even a notion that a, a K-N-O-T is not that, mm -hmm. it's not right. to me, yeah. that we're no. living with knots. That sense of enmeshment is at the core of the book and of your method and temperament, I think. And I there there's another phrase somewhere where you talk, of, maybe in art song or in the introduction where you talk about dance dancing with enmeshment elsewhere mm -hmm. you talk about ethical str ethically striated mm -hmm. or marbled uh mm -hmm. there's a, there's, a, mm -hmm. there's a a large repertoire of terms of mm -hmm. like, terms beloved terms having to do with these these nodes of inextricability mm -hmm. which are sources mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. anxiety tension confusion and there are points in the book where they can explode in a moment that's quasi liberatory, though mm -hmm. you're wisely skeptical about liberation, though you're also greedy for it. <laughs> that nice double movement. <laughs> you know, like, I think there are a few passages in the book where you say, Give me some more of that. Listen, uh -huh. that sounds good. I could yeah. always binge on that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I yeah. guess I don't know if you want to say something more about these notions of. Uh, enmeshment mm -hmm. I don't know I mean it kind of reminds me I mean this is like a you know it says that there are a bunch of you here but since I can't see you I'll just feel inclined to speak personally but I was talking to a friend of mine the other day about like you know domestic enmeshments that were certain things that were like driving me mad and I was like laying out all the ways I wanted things to be and all the boundaries I had and everything and she said that sounds so great you know those are so wonderful she said you know it also sounds like you're describing living alone <laughs> you know? she's like you may she's like you may find yourself alone she's like but if that's what you want you know terrific but it was you know it was very funny I mean she was a therapist and she was being you know it was like it was a very funny moment but I think that it's like you know right when she said it I thought oh I don't I'm not I don't actually want to live alone like that's not you know and then I thought okay well these moments when the choice seems to be like snip the knot and get free uh and then be, be free of the enmeshment but then find yourself alone like you know alienated or isolated or, or cut off from from the enmeshment I'm, I'm not saying there's not clearly we all know we're all adults here we all know that there's much gray area in between isolation and you know codependent enmeshment but I'm just saying that those that to find those moments about how to stay in the enmeshment and not slip the knot in that snip the knot in that way, you know, then begins to bring up this stuff like I talk about in the book with the Brian Masumi quote where he talks about, um, you know, freedom being about flipping constraints, you know, and like fl fl flipping them. Um, and it's a kind of like art of. I mean, to me, that's where like the knots come in. Like you don't wish that there'll never be a knot again. You just think like, oh, if I find one and if I first can sketch it and I first can see it, you know, maybe there's something about just seeing it alone that that is unbinding. Or maybe I see the escape hatch in the, you know, now that I've sketched it, which I didn't see before, like it felt like an iron circle, but maybe it wasn't, you know, stuff like that. So, yeah. I think, you know, Neither of us, I think, like being called fearless, but you know, or think, or brave, or things like that. <laughs> are, I think you are fearless, or or not fearless. You have fear, but you approach as if with fearlessness. The K N O T, the knot, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I associate that, and, and I think clarity, as the near cousin to organization, accompanies you as you come near the the scene of enmeshment, and I'm thinking of a koan that happens mm -hmm. later in the book where you mm -hmm. think, I don't know how to say her name exactly but Pema Shadron uh -huh. uh, says that you know my my oh. personal spiritual guide behaved dishonorably yeah. and my faith yeah. in him is unshakable and yeah. I guess there is a quality and so I guess the clarity comes that you notice and I think relish the lucidity of mm -hmm. that koan yeah and yeah approach it and you approach mm -hmm. many things like almost like bathing in the the light that comes mm -hmm. the irresolvability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I find it very uh, 
in, I find it very enjoyable. <laughs> you know, I think that I've, I've, I've noticed that it can be a frustrating method to, to others, you know, <laughs> who don't enjoy the, that light. Like I don't feel like the light on the irresolvable is enough, you know, because they have the very strong urge for the resolve. And I think, I mean, this is maybe where like aesthetics come in as being a writer. Like my hope is that like, if it's kind of aesthetically accomplished enough, you know, I mean, what's the history of literature and art except for the irresolvable made to feel satisfying, you know, I mean, like, you know, like, so th that would be the accomplishment, you know, so that you're not like, you know, a book like this is kind of weird in that it's like perched between like Cohen and Op-Ed, you know, so it's kind of like, um, I, I see why it would excite more of an urge for resolvability, but that's just generally not my, my practice, you know. Yeah, I don't think it's anywhere near up ed for what. Oh, good. I'm just being self-critical. Self, self <laughs> I think a lot has to do with the ride. Obviously, mm -hmm. I, the, the maybe my favorite of the sections is the most dismal in, in mm -hmm. the which is riding the blinds. Your climate mm -hmm. disaster chapter, mm -hmm. where you speak very uh, mirthfully and tenderly about your son Iggy and his love of trains. And you say, as you enter this playground where, you, where Iggy is playing with the train, I've never been ha happier in my life. And I need to say this out loud because I'll mm -hmm. go it later. And that's, I think that what, what is so uh, exemplary about that passage is, as you show that the, the train is the source of, through the industrial revolution could be seen as the, the metonymy or synecdoche for the disaster of capitalism and, and civilization that kills all hope of future children. Mm -hmm. That you are happiest when you are feeling Iggy's unadulterated, unmitigated love of the speed of the train. And I guess mm -hmm. the last thing I'll say about that is I thought mm -hmm. of it as opposed to an op-ed, which mm -hmm. prides itself on a certain tidiness mm -hmm. and a statement, you're really about the ride, the ride yeah. forward and a kind of energy that you describe in Paul Preciado's mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. too, that, that mm -hmm. does involve, it's not on the road, which mm -hmm. you're very funny about, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a certain recklessness. And as mm -hmm, you describe, mm -hmm. I think Amy Silman, or maybe it's Amy Silman's mm -hmm. term, punk bravado. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think that the ride, like the length of the ride is important. And even though I'm kind of kidding about the op-ed, but like part of why I don't like write that kind of thing for the obvious degraded reasons. But the other thing is just like, you know, you could take, quotes or moments out of like these long chapters but they don't um and have them like mean differently but there's a kind of I wouldn't call it like a sermonistic structure but there's a kind of like you know there's like a, a ride to each of the chapters and and and, and in some ways because you know I'm kind of an optimist in my way like in some ways they are structures like um like the train town one you're saying of kind of like, wow, well, you know, we go over and over again to travel town. We look at these trains, my son's so happy, I'm so happy. And then I say at one point, you know, um, as I'm sitting here, like I imagine it like a film still and underneath it is are the words, you know, the end of the world has already occurred. It began with the patenting of the steam engine in 1789 or whatever. And like, and, and when that's first introduced, you know, the danger is that, the subtitle renders the scene all bad, you know? And then the journey of the chapter has to be, how do we hold, hold, hold this, you know, as a form of like holding the moment that we're in where we don't, we don't, I'm not, I'm not trying to, this is not a talk tonight that your, your takeaway should be that we should exalt the steam engine. My, my point is, is that like, how do we not rob ourselves of like all joy um, by continually running, you know, um, these dark and apocalyptic uh, strips, even even when they're warranted, you know, and how else is there to figure oneself? So I think that the ride, you know, in each chapter, the sex chapter, kind of beginning with a text, uh, a kind of or a text and sexual pessimism and trying to kind of take the ride of that through does something um, similar. But because, you know, optimism and pessimism or whatever these poles are, hope and fear, um, because the idea uh, 
is not to flip the coin and just be like, oh, that coin, that 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 side was too depressing. Let's flip the coin. You know, it has to be a ride. Otherwise, it's just a, otherwise it's just a flip coin. You know. So I, I want to say to the participants that now would be the time for you to put into the Q and A box any questions <laughs> you have for Maggie, and we'll get to them in a couple of minutes. Maybe the final thing I will point out, or it's not a question, is just say how inspiring I found the end of the book where you. Mm perform for us in a way what a relate what an ecstatic relationship to the dismal might be which is not, <laughs> which my is, specialty <laughs> not which is not about sugarcoating it in the right. least or exalting it but dwelling in the interstice between freedom and terror <laughs> and, and just i'm going to read the last couple of sentences you say, I, I didn't and still don't know what opening onto that vastness would feel like. Sometimes I feel sure I won't know until I die, but I'm not going for a freedom drive that's primarily a death drive. All that comes soon enough. Until then, I want to be in, all in, all heart, no escape. That really, Maggie, I think is your credo. And I think those <laughs> of us that love your work, and we are many, it is that quality of a rhapsodic, ecstatic uh, commitment to this unknowable all and all that might be actually already doomed and not there. But it's it is a it's a it's a and, and that there's even there's an ethics to maintaining that rapturous, exulting in the the ride. Mm -hmm. riding in a train called all <laughs> i love the train called all yeah i mean as you're saying that i'm as i wrote down ecstatic relationship to the dismal i was actually kind of remembering you know one of the harshest but i think in some ways most sublime endings to like a book i wrote was the end of the red parts which has kind of like a a revaluing and reclamation of certain autopsy photos of a, of a dead family member and and um and my mother saying that um uh her sister who had been murdered and was photographed um talking about her looking beautiful in in these photos and i mean i do think that that's probably like a, a move i've made before but you know i mean i it, it seems to be the condition so uh, you know i think i'm uh uh, I have a intellectual, but probably like an emotional coping strategy of trying to, you know, like always being like trying to face the dismal, which is, you know, which is of course also a source of tremendous anxiety because if you're always trying to face the dismal, well, then you have run the risk of just spending your days doing that, you know? So I think that in some ways the writing of this book and that chapter in particular, you know, was a different task for me, which was like, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm grateful that you say what you said about the last lines because I, I, I did feel like, you know, for a long time I thought, how am I gonna end this book? And how am I gonna end this chapter? And, and um, uh, I'll, I'll just say this last thing that like, you know, you know, I don't know if this happens to you, Wayne, but like sometimes you have like things about your writing that come like in a dream or like a half dream state. And like that last line in the book I'd written for a long time, I'm not going for a freedom drive that's a death drive, right? And then I woke up one morning and I was like with the word primarily. And I said, I have to say, I'm not going for a freedom drive that's primarily a death drive. <laughs> like I, I have to leave, I have to leave space for also going for a freedom drive that's a death drive there. So I was working on those final lines for like a long time, even in my dreams to try and get it. Like, that's so beautiful. And I'll right. just say in closing, and then we'll get to the questions that you, uh, that you don't have the autopsy. You don't say that the caption for the <laughs> autopsy photo is, she looks beautiful. <laughs> that's the op-ed, you know, in a way, but it's you, right. some, some sense of her beauty leaks yeah. from the horrid yep. uh, reality of the murder. So, so thank and, you. And, you know, in that scene, which I think is similar to here, it is, it's not the thing itself. It's the revisitation in that instance, like with my mother of something that happened 30 years prior 
that is the thing that lends the lens of the beauty. Um, so there's something about repair in in revisiting uh, both in time, but also for me, like in text, you know? So here's a question. That okay. I, uh, do you have a definition for art or what do you consider art as opposed to craft? That's a big one, but I'm just curious. Yeah, no, I don't. Do you, Wayne? No, I, I would, I think it has something to do with the gusto of somebody always hitching a ride on the all. <laughs> Being in a way, a, a lusty hitchhiker on this, on the koan express, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which means I'm, amassing piles. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would just say that, I don't know, I, I went to a, a, a great event last week with uh, my partner, Harry Dodge and Colleen Smith and Helen Molesworth all talking about the legacy of Duchamp. It was like a very, unlikely trio to be talking about Duchamp, but I think that, you know, I thought, I mean, this, but, the, but the question that the questioner asked was, you know, of course, because it's like the Duchampian question was kind of the focus of the day. And, you know, so far as I recall it, you know, Helen was really talking a lot about what we choose to value. And then my partner, Harry, was talking a lot about the social contract of like art is something that we deem not valuable like to buy or sell, but worthy enough to spend our attention and our social time talking to each other about. And I, I actually kind of felt like, I mean, I don't have a definition of art, but I, but I, I was partial to that. I thought, it, I thought it seemed interesting, you know. I think, and then, uh, you know, I, here's, a, here's a question that's, okay, here's, I, I haven't even finished reading the question. So maybe it's, are you reading along with these two I yes. just looked at what's degrading about op-eds. I felt so embarrassed that I just... I know, that's a, but there's a question at the bottom here about how your students might react to the chapter on sexual freedom and Me Too culture. Mm. That's a tough one. Mm. But how do you navigate these kinds of things in your teaching? Yeah. Which you've done since I know the art of cruelty for one emerged from so many classes that you had taught. Yeah, I mean, um, well, we don't read like my work and talk about it, you know what I mean? So I don't, I don't, um, you know, and I don't, I don't like put forth the opinions in this chapter as like our discussion topics. Um, but I think that, um, you know, I'm a big fan of, I mean, for me, when I was coming up, um, I feel like the, 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 the biggest revelation I had um, uh, in college and then a little bit later on was when I read the Shoshana film in Turn of the Screw about the difference about like reading in a relation of interpretation or transference, you know, and interpretation, we kind of say like, we watch the thing and we diagnose the characters or we diagnose the plot or whatever in transference, so far as I understood it at the time. I've understood it variously since, but that really had to do with like looking at, you know, taking myself as subject being like, why do I feel the way I feel reading this text? Like, what does it tell me about my belief system? Um, and uh, not necessarily kind of, so I think that like, I try and impart that to my students kind of like, huh, so you're noticing you feel like this because here's a value that you have, or like just again with like making it clear what their what the premises are that they hold and are bringing to it and then they can keep those premises or they can choose to discard them but I think I think a lot about teaching as just making that process for for students um, more visible as opposed to being kind of reactive in an interpretive um, capacity I don't know Wayne if that you know it makes and what yeah. it's, it's what it is reminding me of is how brilliantly in the addiction chapter you talk about the lure of drugs and mm -hmm. how interesting you interestingly you talk about your own sobriety. It's the most interesting, I can't say it's a defense of sobriety, which you need to know <laughs> defense. Right. The way you describe your coming into sobriety and the gains for you. And it, it, I mean, there's, I guess, but in relation to the question, it's a, it's a sublime moment, but in, in the book, but it, 
that you can at once in the chapter say that sobriety is very important to you mm -hmm. and relish the entanglements of addiction. Yeah. Seems like a pluralizing, which seems like pedagogically mm -hmm. pluralizing. I mean, you taught me a lot, I think, how to do this, but I just think that, um, you know, like a, a, a moralizing encounter with a text or a piece of art, um, it's, I mean, I actually had a student say this the other day, she was kind of asking, why do you think that that's not, like, why are we not free to do that? I said, you're absolutely free to do it. I said, no, you're not free to do it. I just said, I just don't consider it like literary criticism. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so I think like, and in like the drug chapter, I mean, I do, and I, and I think it's also like a spiritual commitment at the same time, which is that like, um, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not useful or like, you know, moralism's not really useful or helpful, even if your task was the ethical task of trying to help somebody become sober or whatnot. Like it's just not actually a useful modality, you know? Yeah. And here's a, here's a question about meditation. And, uh, you know, and I, I, would, I would sort of add to that to, to, to ask you the, about, I don't know, Buddhism more and, and, and Eve Sedgwick's presence in the book as a, a sort of a guiding figure helps root mm -hmm. Buddhist strands. I don't know if that's something that you want to say a word or two about. Yeah, well, it's always awkward because it's kind of like everywhere and yet I don't, you know, it's the Roland Bart line, like I claim no mastery, like I claim not even no mastery. I don't even claim like a, I don't even really claim like a toehold. Um, and I think, you know, I, you know, uh, as a student of like Bart or other people who, uh, you know, w w kind of took any form of philosophy that existed, everything from 12 step to Buddhism to, you know, I mean, he didn't take 12 step, but like, you know, any, anything that's out there, like I um, feel you know, like I, I, I consider including, you know, if it, if it feels relevant. And I think that, um, I think that since a lot of the Buddhist reading and more minimal practice that I've done has been some of the more, some of the, you know, more fruitful and intellectually even fruitful um, uh, things I've done, it, it wouldn't be like intellectually honest to not have the work bear its traces and I think but though as you say with Eve I mean Eve and her chapter pedagogy of Buddhism and you know, having been her student and um having uh, uh you know and then having some you know even whatever teachers predating that um I think that there's also a kind of um yeah like a a, a light legacy of things that she also imparted um to me and that her work did as well you know because anyone who wants to think as eve did beyond moralism or beyond the binary like there's this beautiful um structures of and you know uh, of guidance about how to do that you know that's great here's a, a final question uh having to do with a uh, I'd be curious to know more about your engagement with a pile that includes your fellow travelers in experiments mm. in the essay form who are also writing about mm -hmm. freedom in the context of its slave mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Slavery and its afterlives. Oh, Anne. Hi, Anne. Um, wow, all these great people. Laura Levitt, I see you. I see these people. Um, uh, so, Anne, lovely to say. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, Moten and Hartman are like, you know, they're like all over this book. And I think, you know, the, the kind of, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's weird because my book is not about the same subjects that like um, that those three writers are writing about per se, but there's something about the intellectual dialogue that not just Moten and Hartman have had with each other, but also kind of, uh, 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 Moten's bone to pick with Arendt um, and Arendt's, bone, Arendt's bones to pick with James Baldwin um, and Moten's uh, resurrecting of that. And because it's not just about freedom and slavery 
or the afterlife of slavery. It's also about, as Hartman teaches and like scenes of subjection about the way that like discourses of, of freedom are used to um, enslave and re-enslave and discipline. And so, um, and then that I think for Hartman, I don't wanna you know, speak for her too much, but in my understanding of a book like Wayward Lives coming out of, I mean, kind of after scenes with, you know, other things in between, but it being a kind of like, um, you know, the first being a kind of, um, you know, very, very rigorous deconstruction of, of this disc, of this rhetoric of freedom. And then Wayward Lives being a book that, you know, she says is not liberatory project. This is not living um, free. It's living, you know, for her living as if they were free. The women she's talking about, um, uh, she doesn't, see that as synonymous with freedom but I and, and I and I don't necessarily I, I don't I don't have like a you know like a, a stick in that game per se with like making those decisions but I'm interested as you know I talk about the introduction to this book of like you know David Graeber has a quote that I use where Graeber says you know um you know it kind of essentially like you know which is true of uh prefigurative politics in general is like it's not the, it's not the future thing that you're going for it's trying to make ways of um experiencing the kind of life we want to lead you know now um and so anyway all of this th that whole milieu of that kind of like as if not as if um uh the questions about the relationship that like i mean this is the arendt milton thing about the social the political um, spheres and their and you know the spiritual and their relationship or non-relationship. Um, I mean, all of that was like, all of that I would say was like the bulk of the intellectual, um, like research and thinking and feeling around these questions that went into the book. And then and then they don't take up. Um, it's not it's not a book about slavery per se. I mean, I think I would put. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of babbling, but there's like this Foucault formulation, you know, in the beginning about like degrees of domination. And, you know, obviously when you get uh, so a certain amount of degrees of domination, um, uh, I mean, this is true, like in the sexual freedom chapter, like if you get um, towards certain power relations or certain kinds of assault, you know, you've made the degrees of domination so great that you're not, um, uh, you know, you're not able to talk about some of the realms of freedom that this book is engaged in, you know, and that's also true with like, you know, addiction, like there's many gray areas and there's a kind of like, um, you know, winnowing of the gap. Um, anyway. I wish we could stay all night, but we need to, we need to close. Okay, yes, I, say, I want to say a final, what'd you say? Yeah. I, I want to say just, a hard finish. Okay. Okay. I want to, the, the thing I really want to say, just that is so amazing, Maggie, that you really are so brilliant in, in so many realms of, of, of thought. And the, a, a salient quality of, of your writing is that you are absolutely unpretentious. It's very hard not to be pretentious because most of us <laughs> are afraid that we're not really smart after all. So we just, we lard our prose or whatever with just little <laughs> flourishes here. They're just so it can pass as good writing. And you have a kind of confidence, I think that's, that, that, that isn't a bragging kind of confidence that it lets you say things like, I need to keep the wanting to barf close in mind, or like I don't have a stick in that game. Or, but it's you're you're always ex tonally, you're always tonally entirely yourself, and that is a kind of you use the phrase I think therapeutic contagion. <laughs> therapeutic, it's it's therapeutic to be near your disarmed modality. Well, now you're just making me really red in the face. Right? I love it. Okay, so right, thank okay. you all for Don't listening. Thanks for talking with me, Maggie. Congratulations on thank this you. great book. Thank on you. For you. Okay, bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. bye.